Welcome everyone to the Virtual Complexity Colloquium. Today is my pleasure to host Johan Bolen from Indiana University. Actually, Johan and I are academic brothers because we share the same <laughs> PhD advisor. So yeah. we've known each other for, for a long time. Uh, and he's, he's a professor uh, at Indiana University and he has very interesting research. Um, I, I'll, I'll let Johan Tell us more about it, please. Yeah. Great, uh, thank you, Carlos. Yeah, it is actually. I, I never thought about it that way, but it's but it's true. You and I are, you know, not even brothers from a different mother. We're brothers from the same intellectual father. You know, um, so thank you for the introduction. So uh, let me get straight into it without making too many uh, introductory remarks. Uh, today, I'll highlight two uh, publications of our team in the past. Uh, two, three years that pertain to or that demonstrate the capability of modeling individual cognitive and behavioral trajectories from large scale social media data. And although it may look a little weird that I'm focusing on modeling cognitive and behavioral trajectories for individuals from large scale social media data, um, we shouldn't forget that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, etc., you know, combine the sort of the traces a record of the daily lives to the most minute details of billions of individuals right now, many of whom have been on these platforms for, you know, five to 10 years, almost a decade. And so that creates a unique opportunity to solve some long-standing problems in the area of uh, public health, uh, uh, mental health, uh, well-being, et cetera, where before we were relying on introspective self-reports, now we can actually uh, model these trajectories because they're longitudinal. These, these things change over time within the individual, but also uh, within groups uh, from the, the traces that people, people leave behind in these platforms. And so that, that's essentially what I'm going to be talking about. First, I wanted to highlight um, our team and our lab. So there's a lot of people here that are responsible for this research. Um, the, a lot of this research is conducted uh, mostly within the Center for Social and Biomedical Complexity, of which I'm a director, along with uh, Louise Rocha, that many of you uh, know as well. And with, of course, within and sort of affiliated to the Center are quite a few people that, that, uh, that we uh, collaborate with to bring about these uh, scientific results. So there's the, the two directors. There's Marianne Tintain, who's a postdoc. Uh, with uh, the center for um, uh, a couple of years, but is now an assistant professor at the University of Maastricht. Uh, the Sophia Teixeira, Rion Correa, which is uh, uh, who's in uh, in Portugal right now. Uh, Lorenzo uh, Lorenzo Luasis and uh, Lauren Rodder and Danny Feldes are two faculty member, three faculty members, two of which are uh, psychology and brain sciences. They are clinical psychology experts and are very influential in defining some of the research that you see. Danny Feldes is uh, a, a professor at the uh, School for Public Health, and he's also been instrumental in guiding our research in the area of uh, public health applications. I should mention Alexander Barron, who's my PhD student, and Krishna Batin, who's also my PhD student. Both of them are set to graduate with a PhD in informatics. Uh, later this uh, year. Um, uh, students that, that we've also been, that they're also part of my labs, Harry Yan, Britton Taylor, and uh, Jeffrey Wang. I should here mention uh, some of my Dutch colleagues, Martin Scheffer, Ingrid van der Limput, who are at the uh, 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 Wageningen University, and Claudie Bokting, who's actually a, 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 a professor of psychiatry at the uh, University of Amsterdam, that have been very uh, influential. Of course, I mean, I should thank my uh, funders, have been uh, very important to, to our center as well. Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna talk about sort of two distinct research results that come forth from our work in um, behavioral modeling, let's say predictive analytics and uh, emotive computing, uh, a, a sort of a, a type of analysis that relies very strongly on AI and machine learning and natural language processing as well as complex networks, because we're talking about social media, so the social networks are, in, so complex networks play an important role in this. And so, and, and, and from that springs uh, specific applications to studying human well being, uh, health, and mental health. The first part I'm going to talk about is how social media and network structure can, may interact with our well being. Uh, and it's, it's based on this notion, I mean, you've seen a lot of uh, articles in the news, for example, you had the whistleblower about Facebook, where 
uh, internal, it seems like internal documents uh, uh, circulated in, 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 in Facebook and, and, and Instagram, which is affiliated, um, where their own research were finding that their platforms were having a, a rather deleterious effect on the mental health of, the, of, of, of their users. And so that has led a lot of people to consider this question, like social media, is that really a boon or bane, right? Um, I mean, it's the, the success of social media, if it demonstrates anything, it's the fact that we're very social animals as human beings, right? We, we require face-to-face -face physical relationships, rich social environments, a multitude of different relationships, strong and weak links for our well-being. I mean, it's been well demonstrated in the literature that loneliness is a lethal uh, disease. We need... Uh, a, a, a rich tapestry of social connections for, for our well-being. And of course, you would think that social media, since they foster making social connections, should make us super happy, right? Uh, because it allows us to make more connections to more people. We, have, we, we are more exposed to other people that we can establish uh, social relationships with. There, there's less friction in establishing social relationships. I mean, I remember the time when you actually had to go to, uh, to bars and, 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 and dance to, to, and, and hang out in all kinds of sweaty clubs to meet people, but on social media, you can of course just meet, meet up with people without much friction at all, right? Um, there's also less boundaries in the sense that you can have establish social connections with people that aren't even living in your own city, in your own country, you know, you can establish them worldwide. So overall, the expectation is that social media should make us super happy, right? And, uh, but that doesn't quite seem to be the case. You know, there's been quite, over the past decade, there's been quite a bit of work that shows that even though that does not imply a causative relationship, but then again, you know, you have to ask a philosophical question, yeah, what proves, you know, causation, if you will, but where at least social media use seems to, seems to be connected in, under certain circumstances, not universally true, perhaps, to declines in social and individual well-being. Uh, I'm, I'm just citing a, a bunch of articles here where it was, it was obvious that uh, from the results that the amount of social media use was correlated or associated with strong declines in subjective well-being in young adults and teens, but also in the rest of the population, although it's not quite clear how this effect is mediated by demographic factors. Um, in fact, there's been experiments done where people were essentially just told not to use Facebook and then to use Facebook, and where the effects of uh, 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 the effects of social media use was then recorded for the different cohorts. Uh, there's been a slew of research indicating that social media use may not be a boon to our well-being, even though they cater to a very important human need, namely that for social um, relations. Um, again, I think the recent revelations about uh, sort of internal documents that circulated at Facebook and, and uh, about uh, the effect of, in the, uh, of Instagram on, uh, on a variety of uh, mental health uh, uh, the sort of shows that, that even people within these social media platforms seem to be well aware of what was going on. So here's the riddle then, right? How is it? How is this possible, knowing that social media platforms cater to such an important uh, social need? So what's going on here, right? And so there's there's quite a bit of theory uh, in, in in the social sciences that um, uh, our assessment of uh, our own subjective well-being, right, is to a large degree based on social comparisons to the well-being and lives of others, right? And that's sort of uh, typified in the and the image that you see on the right uh, side of the slide, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of a sarcastic joke. May your life someday be as awesome as you pretend it is on Facebook, right? Because the, the, the joke is that people misrepresent how awesome their lives are on social media. And so if social media allow uh, uh, or cause a systematic distortion of how we view the in individuals that we're connected to, it might have an effect on the social comparisons that we make of our own subjective well-being to that of others. And if that is the case, of course, then that, that could explain potentially how uh, 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 social media use may be correlated with declines in subjective well-being, right? But how can this true, be true for a majority of individuals on social media, right? So to, to cause a correlation, you, you could imagine that this would be true in some cases, but it couldn't be true to the degree that we've observed it for social media, right? I mean, we can't all be all all be awesome, right? Somebody has to be less awesome. There have to be some negative, you know, it's like the uh, the, the joke about Lake Wobegon where all of the children are above average. That's just really difficult to, to achieve. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the complication with social networks is that they, the social comparisons are performed within uh, networks that are strongly homophilic. For example, we know that degree is assortative in social networks, namely that in, 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 in social networks, naturally occurring social networks, we very often see that nodes preferentially connect on the basis of their degree. So high degree nodes tend to, degree to, uh, to connect to high degree nodes. And so to put this in human language, you could say that people who are popular in, in social networks tend to be connected to people who are popular, right? Uh, the, the network on the right-hand side is an example of a disassortative network, but it's not a social, uh, a social network. I think this is a, a, a gene expression network where you have sort of a hierarchical level of control about which gene switches which one on or off, right? But on the left-hand side, you've got a typical social network with, very high, with a very high degree of assortativity, namely assortativity of degree. Again, high degree nodes tend to connect to high degree nodes and low degree nodes tend to connect to, to low degree nodes. And you end up with a network like this where the popular kids kind of cluster together and they connect to each other. So the social comparisons, of course, are largely conducted within networks that are uh, exhibit a high degree of homophily where similar people connect, right? Um, now, this homophily has been demonstrated not just in terms of degree, but also in terms of race, um, uh, gender or sex, uh, religion, age, etc. The truth is that in social networks where people voluntarily make connections to others, we tend to prefer the company of others that are like us in terms of our, our race, our, our, our gender or sex, and a variety of other features. This is a well-known phenomenon. So again, we tend to make these social comparisons in social networks to others that are more like us, right? And that is a very weird thing. I mean, if, for example, politics is another case. This is a, a graph done by Conover et al., uh, who was at, um, uh, who was at uh, 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 informatics here at Indiana University when did this research, showing that on Twitter, at least, if you look at every single dot in this image as an individual, if you look at their political preference, that the Republican nodes tend to cluster with the Republican nodes and the Democratic nodes tend to cluster with the Democratic nodes simply for reasons of homophily. We prefer the company of people who think like us or more like us, etc. And again, you have to imagine that in this graph, the Democrats are comparing themselves to other Democrats, right? But also people probably who have the same age, the same gender, uh, a variety of, of the similar features. And that complicates this real enormously, right? Now, some networks are not homophilic. In fact, the network that I'm showing you here is uh, a network uh, where, you know, where the, the blue dots are um, uh, uh, boys and the pink dots are girls. And so, of course, in, in a network of sexual or romantic relationships, assuming, of course, that, that the, the majority of the population is not homophilic, but, but, but heterophilic, if you will, you will, of course, observe the exact opposite, right? But again, you see the sort of the same, you, you could, even in a network like this, which is um, uh, of, of, of a largely heterosexual group of individuals, you could find clustering according to a variety of other features, right? Uh, overlaid on this particular graph, which really complicates this. So I, I just want to point out here that of course, you can talk about sort of the, 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 the sort of the individual features, right? But then the question is: Are these networks also homophilic with respect to subjective well-being? And this is research that we did in, in 2010, 2011. So it's almost a decade uh, old right now, but but it's but it revealed that subjective well-being or happiness is indeed highly assortative in online social networks. Um, so what we did is we we looked up about uh, five million uh, Twitter users posted 129 million tweets. Um, and uh, we took that sample from Twitter from November 20, 2008 to May 29th, 2009, right? And so the way that we created a network from this data is that we took all reciprocal follow relationships. So if I follow you and you follow me, right? We both follow each other. We assume that there's a social relationship between the two of us. And I know that some of you are already thinking, hold on, hold on, that cannot be true. Uh, th th that is not truly a friendship. I understand this, but this, we don't know who's really friends with whom, right? And you all, it's also difficult to observe this in real social networks, right? When you get people saying, oh, you know, Jeffrey's my friend, and Jeffrey said, well, I don't know, but you want so much. So the, in this case, we used a reciprocal follow relationship as an indicator that a social relationship might exist, acknowledging, of course, that that is not a perfect operationalization of what it means to be friends with someone. But when we use that as a criterion, we ended up with a network of about 102,000 users 
that were in the largest connected component of this reciprocal follow network uh, that had about two, two and a half million edges between them. And there's, there's actually a sample of this network. And as you can see, it's very strongly clustered, uh, of course, regardless of mood, right? And so then for each of the dots in the network, well, each of these 102,000 users, we took six months of their tweets and then we subjected them to the opinion finder subjectivity lexicon, which has about 2,718 positive and 4,912 negative words. And then we calculated the ratio of positive to negative words in the six months of tweets for that individual to determine their individual subjective well being. So there's two things you have to believe here. First, that reciprocal follow link means that they're there's a social relationship, some degree of social relationship between the two. And second, that if we look at the ratio of positive versus negative words in six months of a given user's tweets, that that is an indication of their subjective well-being. So if someone says tears and cry and stomach ache a lot, we presume that they're less happy than someone who says birds and, and, and flowers and, and blue skies, etc. Right? So it's a little bit of an assumption that, that people's emotions are revealed from the words that they use. Uh, online. The subjective well-being that we calculated for every user here in this case was essentially the uh, uh, was essentially the the, the, the the ratio of the difference between the, the positive tweets, so tweets containing a positive word, minus the negative tweets over all of the tweets that either contained a positive or a negative word. Now, uh, does opinion finder, this lexicon, does this match su subjective well-being? Uh, at least this had a lot of face validity for us. So the tweet submit, here's some examples of tweets submitted by high subjective well-being users, right? Nothing quite feels like a good shower, shave and air, I love it. My beautiful friend, I love your sweet smile. It, lots of words there like smile and soul and beautiful that will cause these users, not because of that one tweet, but because of six months of tweets like this to be rated very highly in terms of their subjective well-being. And then for the low subjective well-being uh, users, um, of course, this is not normed exactly, right? This goes from, you know, um, uh, minus one to, 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 to plus one, this ratio. And, you know, but any subjective well-being score does calculated um, uh, below zero indicated very unhappy users. Anyway, I don't want to dwell on this result too much, but what we find is a very strong degree of assortativity of subjective well-being. If you look at these two graphs, for example, you have the at the x-axis, you've got the user's individual subjective well-being, and it's plotted against on the y-axis, the, the subjective well-being of uh, their neighbors. And of course, this can be done at the level of individual edges, but it can also be done at the, at the level of the, the entire neighborhood of, uh, of, of those users. And what we find there, we find these two clusters, simply meaning that happy users, users with high subjective well-being, so they're in the, the top right, are more likely to be connected to happy users and unhappy users, low subjective well-being, because that little red cluster that you see at the bottom left, right, are more likely to be connected to unhappy users. So long story short, we know that even mood is assorted in these networks. So if people are performing social comparisons, between you users with similar subjective well-being, you would expect most of these comparisons to be to kind of be to even out because you're comparing yourself to people who have similar subjective well-being effects, right? And um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but hold on, wait just a second. So I'm just putting the pieces of the puzzle together here. So we're very, we're social beings, right? Um, more social media, more social. Okay, so we should be more happy, but combine that with degree and, sub and, and, and subjective well-being assortativity, namely that we tend to aggregate in clusters of similar subjective well-being. Well, how does, how do negative social comparisons result from a situation like that, you'd have to ask. Remember, these negative social comparisons could be responsible for declines in subjective well-being if there would be some kind of a distorting effect of social media. Okay, so the, the missing component here, of course, well, how to explain this is what we call the, uh, the, or the, the, the friendship paradox. This has been widely observed in a range of social networks. This is, uh, this is a result that has, that has stood the test of time for, for decades. And what the result is, essentially indicates that it, it that is in most social networks, your friends on average have more friends than you do. Um, the reason for that being that um, if you look at how these social networks are organized, is that if you have an individual and you calculate that has a subjective well-being and you calculate the subjective well-being of the, the, the individuals that get their alters, so to speak, 
right? The average of that subjective well-being will tend to be higher for most people in the network than their own subjective well-being. And this has also been extended to uh, a variety of other features that are correlated with, uh, 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 with having a lot of friends. The reason for this is, uh, is, to, is, is, is demonstrated, if you will, in the graph at the bottom of, of, of the slide. And it's related to the fact that degree distributions in the social networks are very skewed with only a very few people being very popular, having a lot of users and most people not having quite uh, friends and most users not having quite that many uh, friends. And these few individuals with very high numbers of friends, right, they drive up since they're connected to more people. The, the, so the, the, they're very likely to be connected to you as well, driving up the average number of friends that your friends have, right? And driving that average to levels that are higher than your own uh, popularity. And that's shown in the graph at the bottom there, where you have one node that has six con connections. That node, because it has six connections, is more likely to be connected to other nodes in that graph, right? And by doing so, Every, every other node, the red ones, when they look at their neighborhood, there's that annoying node that has six connections driving up the average of the popularity of their friends within that neighborhood relative to their own. And so if we put this in a graph, you look at the graph the, um, at the bottom right there, if we look at people's own popularity, let's just say their degree, the number of connections that they have, right? If the average number of connections of their friends, so the people that surround them is equal, they would be on that diagonal line, right? However, if the average number of friends that, that, that your friends have right, is higher than your, the number of friends that you have, your own popularity, you'd be in that red zone. There would be a paradox, an apparent paradox uh, for that reason. It simply means that this is a situation in which your friends on average are more popular than you are. And in many social networks, most people will be above the diagonal line. So no matter how popular they are, these few very, very popular individuals that, that, that connect to very many more people than most other people do will drive up the average popularity of these neighborhoods and, 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 and will drive it beyond the, 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 uh, the popularity of these people themselves, right? So that has been well demonstrated. So, but if happiness and popularity are correlated, right? Now we're getting a little closer to understanding why these social comparisons work out the way that they do, is that let's just say you have a friendship paradox. These individuals, like that, that blue node that has six connections, if that blue node happens to be also have or have higher subjective well-being, what that leads to is that you will also see a happiness paradox because that individual is more likely to be connected to a larger number of nodes. And then if you would be calculating the average happiness of the of your of your friends or the, the friends of any node, right? That average happiness will also be increased because of that very popular individual also having higher happiness, right? So a friendship paradox will cause all features that are correlated with with popularity to also exhibit a paradox in that networks. And, and again, it's not the feature itself that exhibits the paradox. It's just that across the entire network, if you would count how many people would be in a situation where their own popularity would be lower than the average of their friends or their own subjective well-being or happiness would be lower than the average happiness of their friends, right? That would mean you have um, a paradox. And that could then explain why the the so social comparisons, even in networks that have been uh, marked by very high levels of assortivity or homophily, with, uh, uh, you know, in terms of popularity or degree, if you will, or subjective well-being, et cetera, would exhibit a happiness paradox and could lead to negative social comparisons for a majority of individuals in those networks. So a few questions that we asked, right? First of all, is there a popularity paradox in online social networks? Because that's not a given. Are popularity and happiness correlated? And do we observe a happiness paradox if, if, if we do? And what are their magnitudes? Now, for the magnitude of the, uh, of, of, the, um, uh, of the paradox values, what we essentially calculate, you see that in the bottom right, is the percentage of users for whom it is true that their own happiness or popularity is less than the average of their, uh, their neighbors happiness or popularity. So we have a happiness paradox H and a popularity paradox P. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are the questions that we asked. So what network did we use? We used, uh, 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 we, we, we looked up 
uh, we've created the same networks as we did before for about 37,000 uh, Twitter users, same data that we used before to demonstrate uh, mood assortativity in these networks. For each of these users, we have a subjective well-being value, and then we can look up their neighbor, their neighbors in the graph, and calculate an average, um, uh, calculate an average popularity or happiness. I'm sorry, there's someone trying to call me. Uh, within that graph, right? And then we can count the number of users that are above that red diagonal line because those are users for which it is true that their individual subjective well-being, but also their uh, their popularity potentially is lower than the average subjective well-being or popularity of their friends. And that's exactly what we found. So if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you see the individual subjective well-being on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, you've got the mean uh, subjective well-being of their neighbors, and you see that the majority of these individuals are actually above the diagonal line, right? Which means that for these individuals, for example, your own subjective well-being could be 0 0.1, but your friend's average subjective well-being would be 0 0.2, you'd be off the diagonal line. So what are the, these magnitudes here? If we actually plot the, um, uh, uh, let me uh, go back here. So if we plot this in a graph like this, we could simply count the, the ratio of these dots, these individuals that are above the dying line versus all users, and, um, and then arrive at a happiness paradox. However, I've already pointed out that subjective well-being is assortative. So you essentially have two groups of users, one group of unhappy users with unhappy friends and happy users with happy friends. And so we decided to analyze the happiness and the popularity pa paradox for these two groups separately. Right, to have a fair comparison, because otherwise you're including in your comparison very unhappy users to happy users in their, in, in their, in their neighborhood. So we're specifically interested in, in splitting up this analysis in these two cohorts. So we have an unhappy group and, hap and a happy group. And for each of them, we can determine their, the, the magnitude of the happiness or popularity uh, friendship paradox. By the way, the red and the uh, green um, uh, I'm saying, the, and blue uh, ovals that you see are essentially the components of a, of a Gaussian mixture model. So the, 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 this is a two sigma. Uh, this is a two sigma uh, 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 Gaussian uh, distribution uh, that we've used to demarcate where these groups um, are. Uh, these groups are located. Again, we have a happy group and an unhappy group. Happy group does not mean that they're users that are happy. The happy group means that these are happy users that are connected themselves to happy users. And the unhappy group is unhappy user individuals that are connected in this graph to other unhappy users. Okay, so first, are happiness and popularity correlated? Yes, they are, but only in the happy group. So as you can see the, the distributions there of the, um, uh, of the uh, uh, Bootstrap Pearson's R values, you can see that um, the uh, the unhappy users, the, the distribution actually overlaps with zero, meaning that there's, there's no correlation for the unhappy users, but there's definitely a, a strong correlation for all users and for the happy group uh, and that is highly st statistically significant because you can see the distribution doesn't overlap with zero. Uh, now, do we find a popularity paradox? Uh, if you look at the red hand set for the happy group, we find a friendship paradox of 95.8%. Um, for the unhappy group, we find a, a, a slightly lower magnitude of the um, friendship paradox of only 88.8%. You can see that about 90% of the users in these networks experience a popularity paradox, which means that their own popularity is lower than the average popularity of the users that they're surrounded with in the net network. Right? And this is true for both of these groups, as you can see. Um, now, do we have a happiness paradox? Yes, we have a very strong happiness paradox. Um, the magnitude of the happiness paradox is lower. As you can see, for the happy group, it's about 60%. For the unhappy group, 66.5%. And I know that a lot of you are saying, wait, hold up. The unhappy group has a, a, um, a, a happiness paradox of 66.5%. What that means is that in the unhappy group, so these are users that are already that have lower subjective well-being, and they themselves are connected to users with lower subjective well-being. And for them, it's still true for 66%. It's still true that their own subjective well-being is lower than the average of their friends. So that's a very bad situation if you think about it, right? They're unhappy themselves, and they're surrounded by unhappy users, and those unhappy users are still happier than they are in 66% of cases. So that's, a, that's not a very good outcome. 
right? Especially for the unhappy group. And that might actually, again, point to how social media may lead to very, to negative social comparisons, especially for the most vulnerable individuals that have already indicated that they, they, um, uh, they are uh, characterized by lower levels of subjective well-being. Actually, we, this is uh, 2011 data, but we recently did a large-scale survey for uh, a large number of users, and we found, th this is unpublished, that the happiness paradox still holds up. And, um, you know, the, as you can see, overall, for all users in this cohort, we still have a happiness paradox of about 66%. What this essentially means is that for people on Twitter, if you look at themselves versus the average happiness that is exhibited in what people post, you know, by the, of their friends, they will, they will experience a very sharp happiness paradox, leading to a lot of negative comparisons. If they behold the subjective well-being of their friends, which you can presume is actually the case, because that's what we do in social media. We see other people's posts, we read them, right? And if those posts are more positive and happier on average than our own, that might lead to some very unpleasant social comparisons. So in conclusion for this part, we observed a very strong popularity paradox on Twitter, a significant but weak correlation between popularity and happiness, but it's still significant. And then a significant happiness paradox in particular for the unhappy group. So speculation, if social comparison does have an effect on one's subjective well-being, we know it does, but we don't know whether that's the case here in this specific, specific case. And if users, big if, perceive the average popularity or happiness of the neighbors, but it, we, we all have feeds, right? We see these, these, these messages, they, they, they kind of percolate through our feed and assuming that, that we develop some kind of a perception of the average popularity or happiness of our neighbors, then it is possible that this might lead, uh, in, in the case of very skewed degree distributions, which we also observed, to majorities of the users in online social networks experiencing this kind of a paradox and that it may lower their subjective well-being. Um, so that's one one result that that, that we found, and that I think is maybe uh, ex may explain some of the rather should I say paradoxical results again that social media might, grosso modo, lead or be correlated to reductions of uh, subjective well-being amongst the individuals that that use it. I think some of the data that we've seen actually recently, where uh, it was shown that uh, where it, People at Facebook themselves found that Instagram use, especially among certain constituencies and in vulnerable groups, uh, was associated with very sharp declines of well-being, eating disorders, a variety of internalizing disorders like depression and anxiety, uh, etc. Uh, I, I think it's it, it, this may be uh, um, uh, one of the factors that contributes to this uh, effect. Okay, uh, now. Okay, so we've talked about subjective well-being at this point, but I've also mentioned this, this idea that social media use could also lead to more serious problems than just lowering your subjective well-being. So you could argue, okay, so some people feel a little unhappy, what's the big deal, right? But there's a, a number of internalizing disorders like depression and anxiety that are the, the leading causes of disability worldwide. One of the leading causes, right? These are lethal diseases that, that affect tens, if not hundreds of millions of individuals, about 10 to 15% of any population at any given time, which have, have very serious consequences well beyond just being associated with, with lower subjective well-being, uh, or may not even be, be something completely different from uh, subjective well-being. And so even though this result is interesting, it's in, in, it, it, to a degree it's informative if you're willing to, to, to go along with these speculations, there's also uh, uh, the, the notion that social media may contain a wealth of information from which we can perhaps trace the lexical markers, not just of subjective well-being, but potentially of, the, of, 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 of features, individual features um, that are associated with more serious issues such as internalizing disorders. Now, it's been, it's already been shown to a large degree that uh, at least depression and a variety of other um, mental health issues can be detected in written language. I mean, as early as 2013, the Chaudhuru uh, used uh, uh, mechanical Turkers filling out the CSD and BDI service. So these are surveys that, um, that, uh, that are screenings rather to look for uh, depression and uh, found 476 social media users among that sample with confirmed depression. 
And of course, since they're social media users and they were willing to donate their social media data, you can collect data about the onset of the data, when the diagnosis occurred, and look at the, the, the content of the tweets or the social media messages that were posted by these individuals. So you can do look at these two, uh, two cohorts versus a random sample and see whether you could classify users in depressed versus non-depressed uh, uh, cohorts from the content of their Twitter timelines proved to be rather successful. In fact, meaning that you could look at the language that people use online and generate relatively accurate predictions of whether or not um, they may have uh, uh, depression or not. Now, there's other results like Sturman and Pennebaker showed that looked at the, 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 the poems of suicidal poets and found distinct differences in the language being used. Uh, Rude in 2004 looked at 124 subjects, a slightly smaller sample, uh, finding that um, that uh, the essays written by people contain more negative valence words and negative more words with a negative emotional loading and more of the first personal pronoun. Uh, Betty et al. found that for 11 subjects, at least, schizophrenia was manifest in the phrase, phrase length and determinants. I'm, I'm just going to hear just to, to give an idea that it's not just depression. Uh, Smirnova 2013 um, looked at sort of verbosity and narrative differences. And there was this, this great paper in, in, uh, in 2018 published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where Eichstätt looked at Facebook language and then uh, trained a classifier to look at that language and predict uh, uh, whether or not people suffered from depression with ground truth that was taken from their medical records. Really fantastic paper. And of course, we've, we, we ourselves have been working on these kind of classifiers as well with varying success. Now, I will say this though about these kind of efforts. It's, it's, there, there's no doubt that the language of people that suffer from mental health issues differs from those that don't. If you're, if you're suffering from an, ailment, uh, 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 an illness or you're being ailed by uh, a mental health disorder, it's very likely that you might be using terms or there would be features in your language that relate to that disorder. I might be saying things like, I'm very unhappy, I can't sleep, sleep, unhappy, etc. <clears throat> and these classifiers, of course, since they're trained to opportunistically detect depression from written language, will latch on to any of these features that allow the classifier to generate more accurate uh, predictions. But that does not imply that that classifier actually, to any degree, that understands what it means to have depression. Right or anxiety. These are just features that are so associated with a known outcome, right? And these features, as Chaudhary uh, herself actually showed in one of her latest papers, these features might actually be related to the sample inclusion criteria themselves. These classifiers might actually pick up how the samples were put together, rather than to learn something generalizable about depression itself. So one of I, 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 I'm sure that in this audience, there's a number of people that have actually been diagnosed with depression and anxiety, enough to say who you are, of course, um, and that have been treated with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, a sort of a gold standard treatment of uh, depression and anxiety. One of the tenets of cognitive behavioral therapy, by the way, Beck, who invented this, the ther this uh, therapy actually died uh, uh, very recently, uh, is that in, in, one of the tenets here is that individuals who are depressed exhibit what we call distorted modes of thinking, so-called cognitive distortions, which can negatively affect their emotions and motivation. So you have sort of this, 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 this triangle where your thoughts, the, the, the shape or the pattern of your thoughts can affect your feelings, where your feelings can affect your behavior and where your behavior affect your thoughts. It's a feedback loop in a dynamical system that is, that is driven to a large degree by uh, sort of what Beck referred to as automatic thoughts, like the first thought that comes up in your mind and that shapes how you look at things that are very, is very difficult to ignore and that shapes your feelings and your behavior in maladaptive ways. To give you an example, I could say, none of my friends really like me. And I won't go to the party tonight because I will have a horrible time. It will be a complete disaster. I won't go. Right? That's a thought. You might actually think that, you know, whether that's true or not, this is something that people might think. You're not going to go to the party. You're not going to have a good time. You might stay at home ruminating. You might feel bad for not going to the party because you didn't go to the party. You didn't experience the reinforcing effects of the behavior of going to the party. You might have sort of all kinds of thoughts about not going to the party, being home alone, I'm always alone, I'm, I'm never gonna have any friends, et cetera. And so these, these thoughts, they drive this vicious cycle, if you will, of, uh, of feelings and behavior and, and subsequent automatic thoughts that um, 
uh, that may shape or drive the uh, the uh, internalizing disorder. And now, cognitive behavioral therapy specifically focuses on sort of these these thinking patterns, these cognitive distortions, as part of the therapy that people uh, uh, receive. So for example, a therapist might challenge these thoughts and say, "Are you sure that none of your friends like you, or that all of your friends hate you, etc.?" It, in an attempt to break the cycle and uh, have people arrive at more adaptive, more, I wouldn't say positive, uh, but, but at least more suitable uh, ways of, of, of thinking about the, their lives and others, etc. The problem, of course, is how do you measure feelings and thoughts? Right? That, that is actually not a solved problem. And so what we said, what we did is that we, um, what we looked at, at sort of is what we looked at is how these cognitive distortions may be expressed in language. So we were looking at specific engrams that would be typically associated with the expression of a cognitive distortion. For example, uh, a category of cognitive distortions, so usually about 12 are being recognized in cognitive behavioral therapy, but that could be more or less. Um, it's, it's not a hard sort of classification. It's more sort of to elucidate the, the kind of cognitive distortions that one may encounter. There's catastrophizing. That is exaggerating the importance of negative events. Like the evening will be a disaster, right? Well, okay, perhaps it won't be great, but will it be a disaster? You know, is, is Godzilla going to show up? I'm, I'm making light of this, but, but these are serious issues for people who are thus afflicted. Um, you know, dichotomous reasoning, thinking that an inherently continuous situation could only fall into two categories. No one will ever like me. Well, it's, perhaps someone will sometimes like you. Disqualifying the positive, unreasonably discounting positive experience, emotional reasoning, etc. So for each of those 12 categories, um, a panel of experts in cognitive behavioral therapy went through a design process where from their experience, from their expertise in cognitive behavioral therapy, came up with a, a list of n-grams, one, two, three, four, and five grams that were typically being used in expressing cognitive distortions of that type. They're actually highlighted in the examples that you see on the right. My good grades are really not important. So not important that two gram, not important, is very commonly used to express a distortion of the magnification and minimization type, according to the experts cognitive behavioral therapy. Nobody ever cares for me. Nobody ever. Everyone thinks, right? Personalizing. Mental filtering. Thinking that, oh, I'm sorry, uh, mind reading. Thinking that you know what other people believe. Everyone believes. I am A, that's labeling and mislabeling, failure, dichotomous thinking, right? So one tweet or one text could contain multiple of these engrams of these cognitive distortion markers, right? And so then what we did is we use large-scale Twitter data to verify a longstanding hypothesis. The hypothesis, namely, do depressed individuals, people that we know suffer from depression, do they actually exhibit higher levels of language indicative of distorted thinking online? versus a random sample. So what we did is, so the hypothesis is that cognitive behavioral therapy, so this is theory driven, not data driven. Cognitive behavioral therapy as a tenet, as a hypothesis, presumes that cognitive distortions are involved in this, this, this cycle that leads, the, or that is involved in the development of uh, depression and anxiety. If that is actually the case, then you would express, uh, then, would ex then you would expect a depressed cohort to express more cognitive distortions than the language versus a random sample. So if we compare the language on Twitter of a depressed cohort versus a random cohort, we should see a higher uh, 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 levels of prevalence, higher prevalence of cognitive distortions. Now, just to be clear about these engrams that we're looking for, again, these were put together by a panel of, of uh, CBT experts. Uh, that went through sort of a process of collaborative design, followed by consensus voting procedure to define a set of 241 CDS engrams. Now, the CDS engrams are intended to be context-free. So when you say everyone thinks, it doesn't matter what, they, what you claim they think. What matters is that you claim that everyone thinks. That is the mind-reading distortion. That two gram, right, regardless of the context in which it occurs, is used to express that particular cognitive distortion. So it's, it's context-free in the sense that we don't care about whether, when you say I am a, it doesn't matter we say I am a loser, or I am a this, it, what, what, what matters is that the I am a is indicative of you labeling yourself, right? Same with emotional reasoning. So the greatest degree possible, these engrams were designed to be context-free, sort of minimal lexical semantic building blocks of distorted thinking. Markers of distorted thinking. So here's the entire list. This is the lexicon that you can use. This has been translated to German, 
Spanish and Dutch, which also tells you something about the team that we have and the native language speakers that we have in this team. And so you see catastrophizing will fail, will go wrong, will go wrong, will end, will be impossible, will not happen, will be terrible, etc. So those are all n-grams that are typically used in the expression of a cognitive distortion of that type. So these are markers. That doesn't mean that they are the cognitive distortion. They mark a cognitive distortion potentially being expressed in language, right? So what we did is we had a sample of 1,207 individuals that we knew received the clinical diagnosis of depression. And then we, we created a random sample of 8,791 individuals, right, um, that were selected in such a way that their account start date distribution was similar to the depressed sample. This is to avoid platform specific changes in effects. And then we, the date range through which we uh, analyzed the tweets posted by these depressed individuals went from May 2008 all the way to September 2018. That's 10 years of tweets for each of these individuals that we can analyze. Now, I will say we also exclude all tweets that contain the terms diagnosis and depression from subsequent analysis, such that our analysis is not fooled, so to, so to speak, by terms that ind indicate exactly the the disorder that uh, uh, that we um, that we look for when we define the, these cohorts, and what we found is that indeed there's the uh, the the press cohort. That's the, 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 the so this is a, a histogram of the the um, um, the the, uh, the prevalence of these cognitive distortions at the at the within subject level. The prevalence the within subject prevalence for these cognitive distortion engrams for the tweets posted by the depressed cohort blue, and then the orange, uh, uh, the random cohort in orange. And you can see there's, there's, there's a, a, a significantly higher uh, uh, within subject prevalence of tweets containing cognitive distortion uh, schemata. Now, if, if we actually calculate sort of the ratio of the um, uh, of, of the, the prevalences, you can see that at the bottom between the depressed cohort uh, prevalences within the depressed cohort and the random cohort, you can see that on average there's, there's about a 20% higher uh, expression of cognitive distortions in that cohort versus the other. This, this effect is very strongly uh, statistically significant, meaning again that people who are depressed when they tweet, they reveal the traces of the kind of thinking that, cog that experts in cognitive behavioral therapy would, would, would presume to be associated with the with internalizing disorders and that they themselves would seek to to address in the therapy that they do now the, the other really interesting thing is that we split this up by cognitive distortion type we can see that at least two cognitive distortion types are very strongly in, in, in involved in causing this difference one of them is personalizing an emotional disorder the between cohort preference ratio of personalizing an emotional uh, uh, and emotional reasoning is two and a half times. So that means that the depressed cohort has two and a half times more of these cognitive distortion markers in the language than the random cohort. Same for overgeneralizing, mental filtering, disqualifying the positive labeling and mislabeling, fortune telling, the economist reasoning, et cetera. So for, for most categories, as you can see, the, the confidence interval does not overlap with one, which means that the, 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 the prevalence is identical between the depressed and the random cohort, uh, except for catastrophizing, right? But this, the strongest effect, I mean, it's a two and a half X, is observed for personalizing and emotional uh, reasoning. So again, personalizing are where you take things personally, like, oh, it's all my fault. It's something I did. I, I was responsible. It's, you know, and emotional reasoning is because I feel, but you know, people were talking to me at the party. Yeah, but I still feel that, like nobody likes me. Right? It's emotional reasoning. Um, now, the cognitive distortion schemata to so the engrams with the highest prevalence ratios between depressed and uh, uh, in the depressed and random sample, if you could see, is the depressed ones because I, if it only he will think, because am I a burden, all my fault. I mean, you could literally write depressed tweets with these engrams, right? And then the random sample, you will not believe, he does not think, and incompetent, we do not believe. So these are still cognitive distortions but they're just uh, most prevalence in the random sample. And you can see the differences there. So again, this could be used for a classifier, but what we're after is actually understanding the thinking processes that, that are involved in cognitive distortions. Um, anyway, I'm almost done here. Just quickly want to point out that some of you might think, well, is that really cognitive? Because these cognitive distortion engrams, they contain personal pronouns, right? And they might have some valence themselves. So you might be just picking up that depressed people are more are sad or have lower valence tweets at least, uh, 
than a, a random cohort. Well, well the, the truth is that most of our cognitive distortion engrams have no sentiment loadings, at least if you look at the Vader, which is another sentiment, a very highly performing sentiment analysis um, uh, tool. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, so we're, the, the, most of them have no uh, uh, sentiment according to Vader. And if you look at the ones that do carry valence loadings, the average valence loading is about zero, right? which indicates that the cognitive distortion engrams that we use and whose prevalence we detect uh, are not detecting or are not equipped, if you will, to detect changes or differences in valence in these in these tweets. And uh, when we then look at the, the, the sentiment of the depressed versus the random cohort, we also see that these distributions are largely similar. So if we analyze the, the, the tweets, we don't see a big effect of different valence. So if you're thinking you're going you're gonna to detect depression with a sentiment analysis tool, you might be in for a, 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 an unpleasant surprise because there, there's not a lot of data to indicate that depressed individuals on Twitter post more negative tweets but they post tweets where the cognitive style, if you will, or the cognitive structure of the thoughts that are evinced in these tweets are different. Those are co our cognitive distortion schematas. Um, we actually extended this a little bit to looking at circadian phase shifts in mood disorders where we compared the circadian rhythms of uh, a cohort with depression and a cohort without depression. And there too, we found very, first we found difference in circadian rhythms, namely that people with depression tend to be up at night uh, more often. And when they do, they exhibit uh, modes of thinking in their tweets that, have, that run very close to the cognitive distortions that reported earlier. But here's what, what and then I'll, 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 I'll stop talking and I'll open the floor for questions if there are any. Um, we just recently, uh, we, we had a paper published in, 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 in PNAS where we, you, where we looked at cognitive distortions in book language, in books that have been published since 1890 to 2019. And for every year, we looked at the prevalence of these cognitive distortions in the books published of that year. And first, I want to point out that if you looked at if you look at German, because we we translated these cognitive distortions uh, distortions come out to, to to German, it's a very validating case. You can see that, for example, right from the 1930s, sort of the end of the 1920s to 1930s, you see a big spike in cognitive distortions. Uh, my, uh, my colleague Fritz Breithaupt actually believes that this is indicative of sort of the absolutist uh, language that was part of the, um, of what, what you could call the, the language of national socialism, which is characterized by very high degree of absolutist language, never, ever, nobody, everybody, uh, all of them, you know, and uh, sort of us versus them thinking, mind reading potentially, uh, and, and therefore, you would indeed expect to see these cognitive distortions rise tremendously during the before the, the Second World War, as you can see that rise continued until 1946, after which um, things returned to their baseline. But if you look at the left hand side, look for, for English books, this is American English, these are books published in English in America, and you can see that since the 1980s, there's been a surge of these cognitive distortion. It seems there's been a, a surge of cognitive distortion engrams in book language that exceeds, that by the 19, uh, the late 1990s exceeds levels that hadn't been observed uh, in the Great Depression, the First and the Second World War, right? and it hadn't been observed for a century. Spanish, we see more or less the same thing. And again, we see a huge spike uh, 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 for, for German as well. What that exactly means for how our literature may have started to contain more of these cognitive distortion engrams and what that means for, from the perspective of, of, of a society whose language becomes increasingly affected by these cognitive distortion engrams in a similar way as we observed for people that actually have depression and are posting their tweets online, right? Um, he, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult to speculate what, what could have caused this. But again, if you see both English, Spanish, and German have this big surge that started in the late 70s, right, to levels not seen for, uh, for almost a century. We compared these levels to a null model where we randomly selected uh, n-grams um, and then bootstrapped our sample 10,000 fold uh, and then looked at the resulting time series. And we did this specifically because the book volume increased tremendously towards the end of the observation period. Many more books published in the year 
2020 than in the year 1890. And so that means that the null model would naturally be oversampling from more recent books. And therefore, this null model, since it's used as a baseline, would compensate for sort of recency effects, things that happened recently with the Google Books uh, sample, right? Because if, if the Google Book sample was affected by recent changes, then the null model would reveal that. And what we see in all cases is that, well, not in all cases, but mostly the surge that we observe um, is well above the levels uh, predicted by this particular uh, null model, which means that for n-grams of the same length distributions as our cognitive distortion n-grams, but randomly selected. Well, we also, of course, you could split this up by cognitive distortion type, and that gives you some information about the kind of cognitive distortions that seem to become more prevalent in both uh, English, uh, Spanish, and German. Um, uh, uh, English, Spanish, and German language. Um, if you want to look this up in the original journal, I, I provide a reference here. Please have a look. Um, again, what this specifically means is not entirely clear, but it does seem to indicate that cultures can change, language can change, not just for individuals as they communicate on Twitter, but also for society at large, which opens some really interesting um, possibilities to study um, sort of long, longitudinal trajectories, not just of individuals in terms of their mental health status, but also entire societies and how they could be affected by, for example, war, uh, impoverishment, um, and a variety of other external stresses such as inequality, et cetera. I'm not going to dwell too much on the future work here. That's something that we can perhaps discuss when you know things are open up for questions. Um, lastly, I just wanted to mention that we focus on sort of a theory-driven analysis. So it's obvious that when you look at health and mental health, there's a, a sort of a variegated or sort of a, a very broad landscape of applications where you can use AI and machine learning to detect uh, mental health or health issues, right? But the problem is that when you focus at diagnostics, right, a lot of what I've seen in the literature are black box approaches. The classifiers manage to produce accurate results, but we don't quite know why. We don't know on what basis they're predicting uh, uh, these, these, or uh, they, they, they're predicting these issues, or uh, the prevalence of these these issues, and so that opens the the possibility that they're opportunistically rediscovering sample inclusion criteria or other epiphenomena that have nothing to do with the actual disorder itself. I've seen we've seen some pretty uh, uh, galling cases of. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but where, for example, a smart pigeon looking at uh, at, at and, and breast scans can actually detect breast cancer better than some AI and machine learning models because they're just too brittle. It doesn't generalize well, right? There's also some indications of, you know, cats being confused with COVID-19 x-rays. Um, the, I think if we're going to focus on precision medicine, which means that we're going to look at sort of individualized system dynamics of how these disorders come about, and that really matters in mental health because in a lot of mental health, it's essentially um, networks of self-reinforcing symptoms that constitute the, the, the mental health issue, um, then we need to be looking at trajectories, not just features. And we need to look at the, the cognitive behavioral and social factors that lead to the, um, uh, the emergence of these, these issues, uh, not just diagnostic based, based on black box approaches. So I'm a big proponent of hypothesis-driven research in this area. Data and tools are important, but not, much, not more so than understanding the actual mechanics and dynamics of the issue itself. And I think, of course, that needs a very strongly uh, interdisciplinary focus. Um, I think the, the really important thing in this domain, if we want to actually achieve this kind of hypothesis-driven research, is that we triangulate. So far, we focused on social media. There's a lot that you can gather from social media, because especially in the area of mental health issues, because we rely on self-reported, introspe introspective reports of people's subjective well-being, of the, uh, their language, of their opinions, of their sentiments, etc. But that, of course, has its limits. And I'm a big proponent of actually triangulating electronic health records, survey data, and social media data. Our team is actually actively engaged in, uh, in this exercise to arrive at longitudinal individual geolocated data so we can actually do this by community. We actually recently published a paper where we looked at how COVID-19 infection rates correlate with subjective well-being for 20 U.S. cities, so showing that U.S. cities that have higher levels of, of uh, percentages of non-whites are more strongly affected by COVID-19, have a stronger relationship between COVID-19 cases rather, 
and declines in subjective well-being, showing that there's, there's social inequities in how this kind of pandemics affect the well-being of, of communities. And of course, you can only do that if you have geolocated data that you can then uh, relate to a, a variety of cognitive, behavioral, lexical, affective, and social phenomena. And for that, we need system science um, as well. Again, it's not about sort of, uh, sort of flattening the data and working on uh, machine learning tools that can perform diagnostics. It's, it's using artificial intelligence and machine learning tools to understand the dynamics of the um, uh, uh, of the disorders. And I think that's where uh, the biggest bang for the buck is gonna be in the next uh, 10 years. Um, anyway, um, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this. Here's a, a number of publications that I can recommend if you're interested and in, to learn a little bo more about what we talked about. And uh, I'm gonna stop talking here, but talking for about an hour at this point. And uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to jump on the Zoom call or wherever you are and uh, let me know about them. Yeah, the, the chat in YouTube is already teeming with, with questions. If, if you have more questions, please uh, type them in and we'll see which ones we, we have time to ask. So, uh, I mean, from, from all the questions, let me gather a couple of them that ask more or less the same. And it's basically uh, whether you have noticed that there's more prevalence of, of um, positive or negative emotions or let's say high rates of depression depending on gender or age or education level or other socioeconomical variables or whether the friendship paradox is more prevalent in men or women or yeah. these, these differences. Yeah, the, we, we do find this kind of difference actually. I have a student who is finalizing a paper right now where for uh, uh, a couple of hundred thousand Twitter users, we have demographic data. So we, we estimate their age and their gender and sex, and we find uh, uh, market differences in uh, both these paradox, uh, these paradox levels. I mean, it's, it stands to reason, right? So if you have a 16 year old who's on Instagram or on Twitter and using Twitter all the time, they, they may be very sensitive to the effects of social comparison might affect their, their, their subjective well-being. In fact, that was hypothesized to be uh, at, at, at the heart of the reason why Instagram seemed, seemed to have such a pernicious effect on, on young women, right? Uh, ad adolescent uh, young women is because of social comparison, which of course is made very visible by images. Um, but that might not be true, for example, for your grandma who was looking to, to uh, to, to sort of keep track of her grandkids and and be can, and feel more connected to them. So it's, per, it's perfectly possible that these the, the, these effects are strongly mediated by demographic variables. Um, we've seen that recently also, where we looked at uh, uh, we did an analysis of the the effects of COVID nineteen rates um, versus subjective well being declines in these cities. Is that that uh, uh, race? Uh, gender and a variety of other features are have, have a very strong mediating effect. But 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 overall, of course, I mean, even though that might be true, and we could look for specific configurations of demographic features that are that that, that are very strongly associated with these relationships, I would say that the data so far indicates that this is an almost inescapable effect, at least when it comes to the happiness paradox and the popularity paradox. There's an almost unescapable effect in these online social networks because of their inherent uh, structure of being a social network. And so I, I don't quite know how that, that could be solved or how that could be mitigated. Um, but I, I mean, it stands to reason that, that that is a serious problem if we consider that we've got two and a half billion people on Facebook right now, right? That's, that's I mean, that, that's getting close to half of the world's population, online population at least, right? And so it's something to worry about, now, regardless of demographics and, sex and gender. I mean, I was a little worried about the, the news about Instagram, for example, that this was being very narrowly focused on specific social media platforms and specific demographics using these social media platforms, because that would, that could bring about sort of uh, rather, I would say, I wouldn't say foolish, but rather ineffective measures being taken where we look at the demographics of individuals and then try to mitigate the effects of social media for those demographics. But, but our results seem to indicate that this is a very broad, uh, broad phenomenon that uh, that most of us would be subject to. Yeah, that answers the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to kind of gather more questions into less questions that are related. So, uh, whether you managed to study or found a difference, um, like looking at changes in time of mood or 
um, in the sense that, uh, for example, if someone was feeling good and then has a stressful event, it might be worse than someone who was not feeling good. And then there's just another stressful event and it's just like another day in my life. That's the oh, it's, it's a sort of a baselining, right? Of, of Yeah, some yeah. people just have a disposition, right? I mean, honestly, I'm a very, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a very uh, generally, I mean, you have to be careful, right? Because things could happen. People people change, circumstances change, but I'm overall very happy in the video. So my baseline is pretty high, right? So, uh, but that's not true for, for, for everybody. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we can baseline this. And let me show you. I mean, I don't know what I can, I, I have the slides here. Uh, yeah, this is a really funny one. This is a, a pigeon looking at um, radiology images and <laughs> I'm very good at picking out breast cancer. Uh, but let me see where I can find it here um, in these slides. But we did another analysis where we looked at people. Okay. I'm sorry. I, as you can see, I had a whole bunch of slides, right? Um, yeah, here we go. So, so this is where for, uh, uh, for about 100,000 users, we looked at people reporting that they had a negative or a positive emotion, right? Something happens and you go on Twitter saying, I, I am sad or I feel bad or whatever. And then we look at the tweets that were posted shortly before and the tweets shortly after they posted this, right? Which allowed us to actually see the effect of exogenous events on people's mood relative to their own baselines, right? These are, these are, these are mean normalized time series. And what you can see is that you can see sort of the positive emotion starting to grow and accelerate before it was reported, or perhaps before it was noticed by someone on Twitter. The negative emotions, you can also see the decline in Twitter valence, in tweet valence for these individuals relative to their own baseline, right? Before they actually report the emotion. The good news is, Though saying you feel bad, putting it in words causes a very quick reco recovery to your baseline. So if something happens and you feel a little sad or you're not, not quite as happy, it's called affect labeling. It really helps to label your affect. Just say, I feel nervous. I feel unhappy. I'm I am sad, right? And um, there's actually good reason to believe from how the brain is wired that that disrupts the escalating emotion and um, leads to a, a relatively quick recovery to the baseline for, for most individuals. <laughs> so I, that doesn't completely answer the question, but we're, we're very actively looking at sort of these individual time series like we did here and baselining them relative to sort of the long, um, uh, sort, of the, the, sort of the long, um, uh, uh, long running um, uh, baseline of, of, of valence exhibited at least on Twitter. Yeah. And, well, I just want to say, this is what Twitter allows us to do. You know, most people have been on Twitter for like tw 10 years. That allows us to really baseline very well, you know, what their sort of average emotional level looks like. And also, of course, with, to detect change points. Yep. I, I have a question concerning the friendship paradox. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I understand that uh, your friends on average are happier than you are if you're a happy person but if you're a depressed person um you found that your friends are also happier than you are and on, not, average. on average yeah and, and not more depressed is that because there's like a correlation between your happiness and the number of friends you have yeah I, okay so i would be I, uh, first of all i want to make one thing quite clear so when we talk about the valence um, yeah streets that may that probably reflects their subjective well-being that actually the results that i just showed you indicates when people are really having an emotion it does change the valence the sentiment of their tweets and that can be detected by natural language processing techniques that does not mean they're depressed yeah and we have to separate these two so people can be writing very happy tweets it doesn't mean that they're not depressed yeah. right? vice versa so uh, what we observed was subjective well-being at least we can claim that we observe that, not depression. By the way, it's again, the two don't, don't have yeah. to be correlated at all. I mean, just recently, I got very angry at a colleague of mine who kept insisting that, that measuring uh, valence of tweets somehow or language somehow was indicative of depression. That is a very naive and, and, and rather, frankly, rather foolish way of, of looking at this. Depression is a, is, is, is a serious disorder. And that is very different. And again, Carlos, I'm, I'm speaking with a little bit of passion now, not because of the question, which I very much appreciate, but it's something I really want to make clear because I've, I've recently had a case where I had to argue this uh, ad nauseum. Uh, 
Um, but so then the okay, so the, then the question is about the happiness paradox. Yes, what we found is that subjective well being is assortative in social networks. It means that if you have low levels of subjective well being, if you post a lot of negative tweets, in other words, right, that may be indicative of having a negative disposition, you are more likely to, at least that's what our results indicate, to be connected to other people that also have lower subjective well-being manifested in their tweets. So it's a cluster of people that are that are not so happy themselves connected to other people that are also not so happy themselves. And when we look at whether we find a popularity paradox for that group of users, it's very strong, meaning that these unhappy users connected to other unhappy users, 65% of them are still less popular than their friends are on average. I'm sorry, 90%. 90% of them are still less popular on average than their friends are. And about 65% of them are less happy on average than their own friends are. So you can see how this is a very bad situation to be in. You're on Twitter. You're not feeling so good. Your sentiment is pretty low. You're not feeling so, so happy. You're connected to other people that are equally, equally have rather negative baselines of sentiment. And these individuals in the majority of cases are still more popular and happier than you are on average. So if you're not feeling bad, you should definitely stay away from social media. <laughs> At least that's what this result uh, indicates. Now, how is that possible? Well, it is, it is possible because, because of the very skewed degree distributions in these networks. So even among unhappy users that are connected to unhappy users, you get very skewed dist degree distributions. So the most popular of those users still have lots of connections to everybody else. And they're very high, extraordinarily high popularity. Even for the, that group of unhappy users will push up the average for both popularity, the number of friends that you have, as well as the, the average subjective well-being that, that people find in their, the, their online environment of the people that they're connected with. And so it, it's, 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 it's pretty damaging. I mean, I, yeah. I, We've recently redone the analysis and it holds up even, even now to this day on Twitter at least. Yeah. Well, one final question also combining uh, comments from, from the YouTube chat. Um, I mean, there, there are cultural differences in the sense that some cultures express are more expressive than others. Right. Uh, and also there are some contextual things in the sense that sometimes people use uh, language in a certain way that might be um let's say uh ironic for example so the, they can say i hate myself but that doesn't mean that they hate themselves or i want to die but it doesn't mean that they want to die uh, i mean <laughs> I, yeah it doesn't may not literally mean that you want to die but 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 it's still a very negative thing to say right i mean it's not something that people say lightly um uh, but but yeah i mean the, the, that is a very reasonable comment to make because the these these are introspective states that are reported in language and if there's cultural differences in how these things are expressed of course then they would bias our data as well and that's why i think it's really important to to make sure you geolocate that data so that, that you can and, and that's what we've recently been doing with all of our twitter data so you can at least baseline it for sort of local and regional differences in, 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 in language. Now, if you look at the, the, uh, the paper that we just published, looking at book language, um, there we, we validated these results by, by making sure that we perform the same analysis for different languages. Like uh, German, for example, is an interesting case. German is not widely spoken as a second language in the world, right? So that's very geographically limited to um, uh, Germany, Austria, and parts of, of, of Switzerland. There's other areas where people speak uh, German, but predominantly you could say that that's where it's spoken. Spanish, on the other hand, is a world language. It's spoken in, in Latin America, it's spoken in Europe, it's spoken all over the world, right? And so I, I think it's really important to, yeah, to cross-validate the results that you have for different languages, for different cultures and difficult uh, and, and different, and different uh, geolocations. Otherwise it becomes really difficult to generalize this. So I, I, I take that comment, uh, I, I appreciate it. It's something that we, that we work very hard to make sure that we acknowledge these kind of differences. But then again, you know, honestly, I, I have to also say that we may sometimes overestimate the importance of cultural differences. Uh, you know, if there's something, I, I mean, but again, this is speculation, but when it comes to feeling bad, 
if, if it comes to not being happy, if it comes to being depressed and, and, uh, and being anxious, or suffering from these mental disorders, the reason why they're so widespread on a worldwide level is because the mechanisms that cause these disorders to, to emerge are very similar. We, we all, we're all equipped to feel. And I think that we, we tend to overestimate the, 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 the differences of culture and underestimate the universality of, of how these emotions occur in an individual, how these mental health disorders occur in individuals and how they're expressed in, in any language, uh, really. I mean, you can, again, language is a tool that people use to express themselves and we're all experiencing the same thing. Uh, you know, I mean, we don't have different conceptions of the color green. The reason for that is because we all, to a large degree, see the color green in the same way. That's why we have that word. And perhaps these words might vary a little bit, but it's still, we're still talking about green. When we feel bad, I think most of humanity feels the same way. And I will use similar way. I will, one more thing I wanted to add here. We all always look at very low recall, but high precision markers. So in the, the, the analysis of, for example, these individual mood states, we will say, I'm, I, I feel bad, right? We weren't looking like, I feel like an old man. I feel like I was hit by a bus. I feel like I want to kill myself. We didn't look at that at all. We looked at, I feel bad, because that has a much higher likelihood of being an expression of a similar emotion across different cultures and across different languages. Yep. Well, thank you very much again, Johan. Uh, it's been quite an interesting talk. Uh, in two weeks, we'll have Jessica Flack back at 1 p.m. Uh, Mexico City Central Time. And then in December, Denise Puma and Tina Lea Sirat. So <laughs> that's a great speakers. Yep. Um, th thank you very much. Gracias, Oscar. <laughs>